my uh, avocation, my real passion is writing. Anybody who's uh, an author knows writing is the most satisfying thing imaginable. For me, it's nirvana. You know, I was pretty successful in most things I've done in my life. So <laughs> when you start getting all these rejections, it's pretty sobering, you know? It's a lot of fun. It started a second career for me. I'm doing it. I still practice law. I'm still on the Civil Rights Commission, but I hope to be doing it until I can't write anymore. There's really no magic. It's really a matter of hard work, tenacity, diligence. Welcome to the Thought Leader Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Ballou. And boy, do we have an exciting guest lined up for you today. Today's guest is a best-selling author of thriller novels. Some of the best novels out there have been written by this man. He has also been a man who has been involved at the highest levels in government, making great policy to help keep our freedoms alive. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the one, the only, the legendary Peter Kersenow. Welcome to the show, Peter. Oh, with an introduction like that, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to live up to that, but I'll do my best. <laughs> How you doing, my friend? It's a beautiful day in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a beautiful day. I rarely Cleveland, get to Ontario. say that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful day in Toronto, Ontario, too. The sun is shining. I got the, I got a beautiful bay-type window over here, so it's fantastic. So, Peter, I know a little bit about you because I've written a couple of the books you've written. I, I, I read the book that you um, that you wrote, the Target Omega. I, I, I loved it. Fantastic book. And I also read uh, the book you wrote in conjunction with uh, the Webb Griffin Estate. And that was a fantastic book as well. Um, and some of the folks here probably know who you are, but a lot of them don't. And the folks that listen to this, they all tend to be entrepreneurs. They all tend to be champions of freedom, free expression, and free enterprise. They listen to this show because they want to learn from you how they can apply your wisdom to their life, to their business. But before they can do that, they need to get to know you. So tell us your backstory. How'd you get to become the great Peter Kersenow? <laughs> well, I'm still working on that, but um, I'm a lawyer. I uh, started out here in Cleveland. I've lived in Cleveland virtually all my life, with the exception of when I went to college. And also, I served for a little bit in the federal government uh, as, as a member of the National Labor Relations Board. But grew up here in Cleveland, uh, thought I was going to play professional football. Turned out I didn't have the ability to do so. Did play in college at Cornell, but again, that was the Ivy League, even though we played some decent football in the Ivy League way back, way back then in the Mesozoic era. <laughs> went on to law school and went on to become a labor lawyer, a labor and employment lawyer. I uh, was labor employment counsel for the city of Cleveland when the State Employment Relations Act went into effect. Then I went in house for a little little bit. And for the last almost 30 years, I've been at my current firm with um, Benish Friedlander with a couple of hiatuses. Um, I've been on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for 22 years, longest serving member. Uh, which has been uh, a real journey. It's been a journey. In fact, when I was first appointed to the Civil Rights Commission, the then uh, majority on the commission actually opposed my appointment, and the administration had to litigate it all the way up to the Supreme Court. In fact, on the subject of three different Supreme Court opinions. Wow. Uh, <laughs> strangely enough. What happened? Well, uh, they didn't like my uh, viewpoint on things. That's the real reason. The ostensible reason is they claimed that the term of a previous commissioner had not yet expired, which was just a, a bogus argument. But they were so adamant in my not taking a seat on the Civil Rights Commission that they fought it all the way up to the Supreme Court. We ultimately prevailed. And I've been seated on the courts on the court since 2001. Uh, on the court, on the commission since 2001. That's been a remarkable jury. For anybody who knows anything about the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, um, anything that you consider to be cutting edge in terms of the law or culture, the Civil Rights Commission is at the forefront. So we see all manner of things. I like to, to tell people, if you want to know what's going to be happening culturally in the United States five to 10 years from now, come to the Civil Rights Commission hearing today for, for better or worse. Uh, so that's been, uh, again, it's been a, an interesting endeavor. I'm still there. I still got two and a half more years to serve my current term. Wow. And uh, frankly, you know, I've enjoyed it. I think it there's a contribution to be made and I wouldn't mind re-upping for another six year term. Uh, then uh, about 15 years ago, I was also appointed to the National Labor Relations Board, which for some of your uh, viewers and listeners 
might know is the administrative body that deals with labor law in the country. I was privileged to serve on that. It's a five member presidentially appointed board. It was another one of those things where uh, the uh, Congress said they didn't want me to serve, but um, they relented. And, um, you know, um, I have a very, uh, you know, a, not a very, but a, a, a position that is uh, contingent upon not just um, doing the right thing, but doing the right thing according to the statute and existing law and not trying to make new law. In other words, I take a more conservative approach to many of these things, applying the law to the facts and trying to extract ideology from the equation. Uh, and there are certain positions, I seem to get you know all the hot button positions, but there are certain positions within the federal government where that's not necessarily what certain partisans like. They prefer you to be ideological. So I don't think that that's my position. So then from there, I spent two years there, came back to my old firm. Um, this is my office here. It's a uh, fairly large firm. We've got nearly 400 lawyers, and I do labor and employment law here. But my uh, avocation, my real passion, and as is yours and probably anybody who is listening to this, is writing. And I have to say that every lawyer, in every lawyer, there's an aspiring writer. I don't know too many lawyers who haven't at least taken a stab at writing a manuscript. Sure. And uh, then maybe they you know, get busy on something, they fall out of it and don't pursue it any further, or you know, other things intrude in their lives. And something like that happened to me actually about 35 years ago is the first time I took a stab at writing. And I, I distinctly remember what happened. You know, I'm a big fan of Elmore Leonard novels and a lot of other novels. I love all kinds of I love of Elmore Leonard. He's amazing. Yeah. But, and that's just it. I read probably, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen Elmore Leonard novels over the course of maybe, oh, a little over a year. And I said, you know what? I want to write novels like this. So what I'm fairly decent at, at least in terms of my uh, legal writing and other uh, kind of writing, political writing, is I can pretty much emulate the writing style of many people. So I try to emulate Elmore Leonard. And this, again, this is about 35 years ago and failed ca catastrophically. I could, there's no, he writes so sparingly and simply, as you know, yep. yet he's a genius at doing it. I it was an amazing thing. And I, and I just got frustrated and said, well, I'm never going to be a writer. And then one day uh, I was at a deposition out in California. I'm on the eastern side of the United States. But I was at a deposition in California. I was supposed to be at a deposition. It turned out the deposition got canceled. So I'm sitting in LAX with nothing to do and with a four and a half hour plane ride ahead of me. So I started scribbling some things. And then I got on the plane, four and a half hours, red eye flight, wrote four and a half hours worth of writing. I had a couple of chapters and then I put it away. And then I had a little lull in the practice, not a lull, but you know, one of these things where I wasn't going 24 seven, wrote a little bit more, wrote a little bit more. And next thing you know, I had what ended up being Target Omega. As you know, at least with first time authors, you don't get to choose necessarily what the title of your um, novel is. I, it was originally Omega, and they decided because of marketing reasons, it would sound more like a science fiction novel than an, a, thrill, a political thriller. And in addition to that, there were some other um, books with Omega in the title. So they called it Target Omega. Not necessarily my favorite title, but nonetheless, uh, you know, roll with the punches. And, uh, you know, I went through the, the usual thing that most first time authors do. I sent out manuscripts to a bunch of different folks. I didn't belong to any kind of writers associations or groups or anything, support groups or anything like that. I just kind of did it on my own, sent it out. And I was aware that you'd get rejections, but uh, you know, I was pretty successful. In most things I've done in my life. So <laughs> when you start <laughs> getting all these rejections, it's pretty sobering, you know, yeah. it's uh, but I did get a few nibbles and um, a couple of uh, publishing houses said, well, you know, if you tweak it here, tweak it there, we think we can work with it. And then one day I got, a call from my agent, who the person who's current my agent, and he was ecstatic about it and said, "Hey, is the is the uh, work still up for uh, uh, for representation?" And I said, um, "Yeah, it is." And so he undertook it, and um, you know, we got a, a a deal from Random House, a Penguin Random House, and uh, you know, ran from there. It was a lot of fun, as you probably know. Um, and anybody who's a, an author knows writing is the most satisfying thing imaginable. For me, it's right. nirvana. I enjoy doing it much more than the practice of law. I happen to be good at the practice of law and it pays the bills, but the writing is where the passion lies. 
And uh, it's been it's been a nice ride. I've been the, the first time I was published was in 2016. And it was enormously exciting to get published, of course. Uh, the whole rollout and all of that stuff is a lot of fun. But it was just the accomplishment of having put some words on paper that a few people actually liked and enjoyed. And I would get, um, you know how it works. You get you, you get emails, sometimes phone calls and letters from fans out there. And what really gratified me was, you know, Target Omega has as a protagonist a uh, former Navy SEAL guy. I mean, it's almost like stock now. But uh, it's a guy who goes off and he works for um, clandestine agency and all kinds of interesting things happen. Well, um, I started getting emails from Navy SEALs saying that really, really enjoyed it. And you've depicted what we're like really realistically. You've nailed it. And then I get phone calls or, or emails from other people in various agencies who said virtually the same thing. And um, I hadn't really expected that. I, I was hoping for something like that. But when you are, you have fidelity and respect for the things that these people are doing and try to be as honest about it. It doesn't help, doesn't hurt that a number of members of my family uh, were either in the Marines or special operations. So whenever I would have something where I didn't really understand because I didn't serve in the military, I would run it by them, even if it was a little thing like um, jargon, not, not just jargon, but um, a uh, give and take between two guys. And my brother-in-law, who's pretty harsh about these things, you know, he said, we wouldn't talk like that. You know, wusses talk like that. So, you know, you change it. And that that was very helpful because, I again, I hadn't served. <laughs> I wasn't there doing that kind of stuff. I didn't know how people talked in certain situations. But um, that guidance was extremely helpful. And also, you know, um, being a fan of the genre, I read just about everybody I could get my hands on to try to get a sense for how they approach things. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, it started a second career for me. I'm doing it. I still practice law. I'm still on the Civil Rights Commission. But uh, as I said at the outset, the passion lies in writing. I hope to be doing it until I can't write anymore. And I try to set aside a few hours a day. It's difficult because I've got a pretty robust practice. And again, the Civil Rights Commission takes up a few hours a day, almost every day. But I try to set aside a few hours a day where I can you know, usually either at the end of the day or I'm an early riser, usually get up at 430 in the morning, get a get a workout in and try to get some writing in by before I go down to my office. And then the weekend, uh, my wife knows, my long suffering wife knows that the weekends are writing. You know, after I get my chores done, uh, it's all about putting and I don't type, by the way, um, no. I put pen to paper. And what I do is I get up at 536 in the morning on a weekend, uh, get stoked up on about a couple of gallons of coffee, and then just start writing. You know, it's stream of consciousness. I rarely plot things out. Um, one of the benefits to being a lawyer is sometimes you've got to write things, boom, just like that, motions and everything. So I just sit there and sometimes I might try to gather thoughts for a minute or two. But I find that when I start doing the physical act of writing on a um, pad of paper, suddenly the words start streaming, plots start to form, the sentences take care of themselves, the, the characters start to say certain things. And you know that a number of authors, I've, I've heard say this, that uh, they have characters that talk back to them. And I've got characters, I still remember distinctly, this was several years ago, sitting there and one of my protagonists or my principal protagonist in the uh, Omega uh, series, Mike Guerin, <laughs> sounded like he was in my head. He said, I wouldn't say that. It, it was almost <laughs> as if it was audible in my voice, in my head. So, um, but it's a lot of fun, as you know, it's, it's an enjoyable way of not just passing time, but you know, hey, it's remunerative too, so that helps. Ever since I was a little boy, uh, Peter, my dream has been to be a published novelist. I, I, I have read over 4,000 books in my lifetime. Um, if you can see behind me, this is my, my office library over here, my home office. I got an office offices too, which is also chock full of books. And um, on the podcast, I've interviewed tons of authors, but I've interviewed, besides yourself, two novelists, two very successful novelists. One is Don Bentley, who also writes for the Tom Clancy universe, as well as his own books. Uh, 
He's great. And the other one is G. Michael Hopp, Jeff Hopp. He uh, writes post-apocalyptic fiction, and his most famous book is called The End. He also wrote a poem, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, that goes something like this. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. This is the man who wrote that poem. They both have come on my show. They've talked about what it's like to be uh, a, a writer and how to get their work published. Um, Jeff um, decided to go mostly down the self-publishing route. He got a deal with a big publisher after his first big self-publishing success. Don's only gone down the traditional publishing route. And like you, he got a whole bunch of uh, rejection letters. So I published, uh, self-published a bunch of business type books primarily. So um, these are some of my business books right here. These are five of my business books that I've written. I wrote a fitness book with an Olympic gold medalist. I've written two political books with Wayne Allen Root. I don't know if you know who Wayne is. I know who he is. I don't know him, but I know who he is. Yeah. So he and I, we have a book out right now that's a number one Amazon bestseller in a few categories. So those are exciting. But what I'm most excited about is many years ago in the 90s, I wrote a novel and it was trash. I, I, you know what I mean? There were some sections that were good. It never got published. A bunch of people rejected it. And I put it aside and I kind of listened to the voices around me saying, nah, man, go make money. You're good at this stuff. This writing thing's just not. And when I talked to um, Jeff and Dawn, they're like, dude, this is your dream. You got to go for it. So I wrote a book when I spoke to, to Jeff. Um, I, I did. There's this program out there that's called 75 Hard, where people are going and working out and twice a day and eating a certain way. So I did the 75 Hard program and I decided to modify that and I called it 75 Right. So every day for 75 days, I would write a minimum 500 words. I actually ended up being over 100 days. I wrote a 64,000 word novel. And that's the thing I really am excited to get published. I'm scared. I'm nervous. I, I want to get it out to some people traditional publishing types. I'm, I'm expecting a ton of rejection, but one way or another, I want to get this dream of mine out there. Before I die, I'm going to be a published novelist. <laughs> so, well, you know, as I say, go for it, as you know, because you've done it. There's nothing more pleasurable than getting published like that, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, you know, I have kind of the same approach that you do. I try to have a minimum, although I don't stick to it all the time, of 800 words a day. On the weekends, it's longer than that. Weekends, it's about 2,000 words. And um, I think for me, I try to observe that regimen so I can I don't have any lapses, no lulls, and I can continue moving forward. And, um, you know, other people have different approaches. I had never, for example, before I began writing and got published, I'd never belonged to any of these writers groups. Um, they're kind of support groups that help people um with their writing, but also with getting an agent with publishing. I didn't belong to that. And I didn't even know they existed at the time. I should have thought about it. But um, I thought that, uh, I, you know, I've read a number of things about it since then. But my approach is one that suits me the best. And um, all I know is, you know, for the rest of my life, I just want to continue writing. It's just so gratifying to me. Yeah. And although I write fiction, Mainly, I've been, people say as a lawyer, I've been writing fiction all my life. But um, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, for most of my life, I've had to be hew to. People ask me sometimes, how can you write so fast? And I say, I'm making it up. It's fiction. When I'm writing the law, I've got to adhere to what the facts of the case are. Then there's case law that is immutable. I've got to write that. And it's not, I mean, you know, I, I enjoy writing briefs. I've done a number of Supreme Court briefs and some very high level briefs uh, where the consequences are fairly significant monetarily or in terms of policy. But um, the fiction writing for me is the most satisfying and it's the most fun and has garnered the greatest amount of reaction. Of course, when you write briefs and in court, the reaction is whether or not, you know, the court grants the summary judgment or rules in your favor and it's great for the client. And, and there's no doubt some gratification there. But when you're writing for an audience that appreciates the manner in which you can put words together to entertain them, um, that's something separate and apart. I really enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally, I totally get that. That's, that's spectacular. That's absolutely. So fantastic. you wrote a fitness book? I did with uh, Mark McCoy. It's called Mark McCoy's uh, gold medal fitness secrets, raw and real. And McCoy is spelt M C K O I as in the real McCoy. Um, it's, um, I, I also wrote, um, 
uh, two political books, a children's book. This is my children's book. I wrote it for my little kids. It's called Kathy Capitalist and Johnny Jobmaker. <laughs> it's an antidote to to wokeism in children's books. It's about <laughs> teaching them about free enterprise and capitalism to so make them good capitalists. So um, I love to write. And I got a book out right now. This is this is my latest book with Wayne, The Great Patriot Bicot Book. This is a 123 conservative patriotic companies that you can spend your money in or invest in versus some of these woke crazy companies that are out there these days. So yeah, like Budweiser. <laughs> Budweiser was in the book before they did this because they had traditionally been a patriotic pro-American company. They give money to Republicans and everything. And what the hell did they just do? We have to pull yeah. them out now. I yeah. had to call a guy up and say, we got to redo the book and pull Budweiser out. <laughs> oh yeah. Go woke, go broke. Oh my God. Like, what was that all about? Like friends of mine who are bud drinkers just don't drink bud anymore. You know, and there's um there's a guy named uh John Lovell. He runs the Warrior Poet Society, okay? And he was in a um uh in a uh gas station down south. Um and they had case upon case of bud there. Uh and he went over to the to the to the cashier and he said, How's your bud sales going? He said, People stop buying bud. We, we haven't sold any bud. All our other beers flying off the shelf. No one's buying bud. Yeah, I told you personally, I had a six pack of bud in my downstairs refrigerator and I saw that and I just went downstairs. My wife was wondering what the heck I was doing because, you know, I would never ordinarily do this unless some type of insanity had seized me. And I took the, the little thing, went out to the back porch and poured it out very ceremoniously. <laughs> I, I don't know what the, I think what bothered me more than anything else is they went out of their way to insult their base consumer. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it was really why now, not that they can't necessarily expand to another market, but uh, the manner in which they did this, it was a kind of virtue signaling. And the last thing a, a bud drinker or any beer drinker wants is any product that is a virtue signal. It yeah. doesn't matter what you're trying to virtue signal, but virtue signaling is off. Leave some things alone, please. Yeah. The problem is that the, the, the left isn't allowing for that anymore. They're, they're just attacking these corporations, and most of them, unfortunately, are selling out, or they're they're weak, they're scared, they don't want to be attacked by the mob. What they need to understand is if they stand up to the mob, that's when they're going to really start to do well. So, give you an example: one of the companies in our book is the UFC, run by Dana White. So, um, you take a look at the UFC's fortunes over the last four years versus those of the NBA. I'm a massive NBA fan, you know, ever since I was a little kid. Boston Celtics fan from way back, you know, uh, loved uh, folks like Bill Russell, you know, uh, Sam Jones, Larry Bird, Dennis Johnson. That those That's my era. I love the NBA. Absolutely love it. I took my kids. I live in Toronto. I took my kids uh, to see the Raptors games the year that they won the championship. It was a huge deal. It was amazing and fantastic. And then the NBA has guys like LeBron James getting angry when one of the GMs stands up for the people of Hong Kong. Right. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You pretend to be for the people and against oppression, and and this is this is what you say, and then they support BLM. God bless you. Of course, Black Lives Matter. Everybody knows Black Lives Matter. White Lives Matter. Asian Lives Matter. All Lives Matter. You've got to respect people. But when an organization that's primarily funded by rich white liberals, let's be honest, because that's who's funding them, right? George Soros, number one check writer to that organization comes out there and says things like, we want to destroy the nuclear family. Oh, I'm sorry. What does that have to do with black lives? Because I, I, I missed right. I missed the memo on how that helps black lives. Right, right. That or more. Well, you know what? They're, they're, they're almost successful in that because right now, 73% of all black kids are born to a single parent household. That's nuts. When you talk about one of the greatest tragedies in America today, something that is the, responsible for so much of the dysfunction that we've seen that's precisely it. No, 100%. 100%. And all I'm saying is one of the reasons we decided to get into the business of writing these books is we wanted corporations to lay off of that. Stop virtue signaling. Stick to business. You know, we created a freedom scale. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, we've been on a bunch of shows. We're working on getting on some other ones, trying to get on the Larry Elder show. You know, hopefully we'll be able to get on Larry's show and 
Uh, we want to get on as many well, shows as Remind we can. me of that because Larry is a longtime friend of mine, known him for over 40 years. We began practicing law in Cleveland. We're one of just a handful of black attorneys at major law firms here in Cleveland. I've been on Larry's show probably 30, 40 times before he retired. And oh, wow. in fact, we actually did a show on, a, on occasion here in Cleveland. He was on the local PBS station and he would have me come on. And we had a rocking good time because he had two black guys who no one could figure out. These two conservatives, you know, <laughs> two conservatives. They just blew everybody away. And uh, in, in fact, at one point, though, Larry dated my daughter, my, my, not my daughter, my sister-in-law, my younger sister-in-law. So um, oh, wow. we go back a long way. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you. That'd be great. We, we, we definitely... He's doing a show for the Epic Times these days, and they wrote up a, a piece on us, which is good. They're featured in the book, too. Coming back to you and your work. Um, so you published that book. You had some success with it, and you wrote a follow-up book with it. And then you got connected with the, uh, with the Webb Griffin estate, and right. you did one of their books. Walk us through all that. Yeah, well, I was doing my own series, and then, you know, minding my own business, paying attention, staying, staying off the streets and all of that. And then one day my agent called me and he goes, uh, Hey, um, are you familiar with W.B. Griffin? And I said, of course, I'm familiar with W.B. Griffin. I've only read about 30 of his books <laughs> uh, and mainly in the presidential agent series. I read all the presidential agent series. I, I'd read some of the men at war series, which is the series that I'm currently writing yeah. and a few of the other series, by the way, W.B. Griffin, I don't know how he could be as prolific as he was. I don't even know totally. I can't off the top of my head how many books he wrote. But 70 plus. Right. <laughs> how does he, even if I weren't practicing law, I don't know how he could do that. It was astonishing. Yeah, it is. So in yeah. any event, I liked the books. And he said, well, how'd you like to uh, do something similar to what Mark Greeny is doing? You know, Mark Greeny has done sure. you know, Tom Clancy. And, you know, there have been another number of people who've done the Mark yeah. uh, Tom Don Clancy. Bentley, the other fellow I told you about who was right. on my show. Yeah. Right. And I said, uh, yeah, why not? Sure. I mean, I know W. Griffin. Uh, it's a big honor to be writing. And also it's a big responsibility because you've got a lot of you got its huge fan base, which is familiar with his writing style. And you know how it is. Once people like a particular author and they like the characters in a particular line, you can't really depart from that. You've got to have some fidelity to that. And that's almost impossible to do. My writing style is different from W.B. Griffin. And the good thing is the publishing company said, don't worry about necessarily emulating his writing style, but you have to have fidelity to the chronology that's already been established with respect to the principal characters. The principal characters can't all of a sudden change their personality and be something different than they are, those kinds of things. And then it's historical fiction, which has its own challenges, you know, because uh, you've got to get the history right. And the fictional part of it has got to be plausible and consistent with the history, not just chronologically, but in terms of the theme. You can't have, say, um, Admiral Canaris, who's the head of the Abwar of, of Germany, sure, uh, who was considered to be, quote unquote, the genius. You can't have him acting inconsistently with what he did during the course of his career. So uh, that was a little bit of a challenge. I enjoyed it tremendously. I had a great time doing it. I liked historical fiction. I'm currently working on the sequel to The Devil's Weapons called The Devil's Assassins. In fact, I'm almost done with it. And one of the sobering things is, you know, it's W. Griffin has a worldwide fan base that's been loyal to him for decades. And people, if if you, what I didn't, what I did know, but uh, it becomes a little bit more sobering is that people send emails and letters. These are hardcore fans who some of them really appreciate what you've done and have noticed certain little um, innovations that you may have. Let's put it that way in how the, uh, characters <laughs> progress. Uh, but then there are those who don't like innovation. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> and they let you know it right away. You better get, you know, they don't like the fact that maybe you added a certain element to it. And, and I don't. I mean, Dick Kennedy, who's the, the protagonist, and Eric Fulmer, and, you know, the historical figure of Wild Bill Donovan, they're all consistent with what W.B. Griffin did. But they will find, I get, I get emails mainly from Germany, the Germans don't necessarily like being the bad guys, you know, and you've got it. They're the bad guys, right? They're the bad guys. But the what they will find is, and, this, and I appreciate this because you want to have, uh, you, you want to be punctilious in terms of things like weaponry. 
Yep. People who are experts with weapons know their weapons. And I remember someone emailed me something about uh, there was one weapon where I, there was a, a fire rate that I had that would have been implausible. Uh, there's no way. I, I don't even remember what it was. It was some weapon that I had been talking about. Maybe it was a it wasn't a Garand, but it was. Um, no, it was a Soviet semi-automatic rifle. And this person was familiar with it. And I had researched it. And I thought I knew it. I'd never fired one. And he said the fire rate that I suggest happens in the novel, because the way the firing was occurring during the course of this particular scene, he said that could not have happened because the fire rate, the, the, the cycling rate was different. So you got to be careful about those little things. And you're never going to get them completely right because you've got thousands of historians and military experts and weaponry experts out there who are going to be pouring over this thing and punctiliously fine tooth comb and they'll find every, every little thing that you get wrong. And, it, you know, it's good because it makes for a better second novel and third novel, but also, you know, it's kind of like, Oh my goodness, I spent all this time on it and I got that wrong or got that. not <laughs> <imperfect>. so, <laughs> Listen, um, you, you did a fantastic job with the book. I really loved it. I I've been waiting for that book to come out because they, uh, he, he, he was ill and then he passed on. Right. So the book didn't come out originally when they said it was going to come out. And it got it kept getting pushed off. Like I pre-ordered it when it was supposed to be out in 2019. And, right. And then they said, Oh, six months later, six months. I'm going, what happened? And then it goes, Oh, he died. I'm like, oh, they must be having someone else write it. But they, I didn't know who it was. I didn't know that it was you. And um then the book arrived. Uh, you know, my pre-order arrived. I'm like, oh, Peter, okay, cool. And I bought Target Omega uh at the same time. And I had not started reading Target Omega yet. And I just decided, okay, I'm going to read this one first because, you know, <laughs> I know the W.E.B. Sure. W. Griffin thing. And I read it and you did a fantastic job. It was great. You stayed true to the characters. I love the book. And then I read Target Omega and I really love Target Omega as well. I just got a, a lot of joy from reading both of those books. I appreciate that. Target Omega, I've got uh, sequels pending for that. Once I got on W.E.B. Griffin, I wanted to do justice to W.E.B. Griffin. So I had to kind of put the Target Omega series to the side. And I have a third series, which I've already finished the first novel on. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be editing it after I get the W.B. Griffin book done, The Devil's Assassins. Um, and it's the Black Russian series. It's a new series that I've got. It's, again, similar to the Omega series. It is clandestine ops, and it's based on a Russian um, uh, operative, and the characters, I changed the names to protect the innocent, but you'll see Vladimir Putin in there very clearly. I don't yeah. use his name. I use um, uh, Vasily Blokin is the name of the, um, the the president of Russia. But it's contemporary. It It's based on what's going on right now and what happens in that one. And I don't know when that would be coming out. But um, in that one, I'll just give you the broad outlines. In, in the Black Russian, this is a Russian agent who is kind of like the James Bond of the Soviet Union, of, of Russia, and he defects, uh, at least ostensibly defects. The United States wants to use him because he's a spectacular operator. He's he's virtually a guy that we could never stop before. So when he defects, we're overjoyed that he's defected to us because he's spectacular in what he does. But we assign one of our guys to kind of watch him to make sure that he doesn't actually turn out to be a double agent or that he somehow goes off on, on a tangent. Yeah. And of course there's considerable amount of mayhem. There's action on top of action, bodies flying all over the place, every form of weaponry you can imagine. Uh, it's like, you know, it's, it's a kind of Tom Clancy, James Bond, um, gray man on steroids but again, the protagonist, what I wanted to do, and we'll find out whether or not in literature you can do this. What I wanted to do was take a bad guy, an unequivocally bad guy, and make him the protagonist and see how that works. Now, he does good things, but that's because he's charged with doing him. He's got to do him. But he is he is essentially a bad guy. And you're always wondering, is he truly a double agent? Did he really defect to the United States or is he still in the employ of Vladimir Putin? I like it. I like the concept. You know, it's kind of like an anti-hero um, who's being forced to be a hero type of thing. Yeah, right. And um, I like it a lot. I think it's great. I can't wait to read it. Um, good body count. Large, for all you guys who like action, big body, good body count. count. <laughs> and, and it's very contemporary. I mean, the, the things that are transpiring right now are in the book. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm looking forward to reading it. 
what advice would you give to someone like me right now? So I've published a number of books. Uh, they've all been nonfiction right now, except for the children's book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I actually have a 10th book that is likely going to be coming out very shortly that I'm writing with Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, U.S. Uh, Army Rangers retired. Do you know Colonel Grossman? No, I don't. You may know his most famous book. It's called On Killing. I, I'm familiar with it. I've not read it, but I'm familiar yeah. with it. Um, it is a study of the impact of killing people on law enforcement and military personnel in mm -hmm. a free society. And I think he sold something like a million copies of that book worldwide. And then he wrote on combat, on spiritual combat. Uh, and now he just released on hunting. And then he came on my show and I developed relationships with the great people that come on my show. And he was talking about sleep and he was thinking about what's my next book going to be. And I said, I know what your ne next book is going to be. He said, what? He said, you're going to co-write it with me and it's going to be called On Sleep. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, that's a great idea. Let's talk offline. So we did a deal and we're going to do that's that. That's great. Book, which is fantastic. I'm excited. I love co-writing books. I've co-written a few books with a bunch of folks. The one I've got with Wayne right now is amazing, but I really want to get my novel out. That's one thing that I want to get out. And there's a part of me that's nervous as hell, but I'm going to do it. What advice would you have for me? I've done three drafts. The initial uh, uh, draft went to Jeff Hopp. He read it. He gave me some advice. What do I need to do to take it to the next step? Yeah, well, I, I think for me, I was just, it was very fortunate that uh, I had an agent who was phenomenal. He just he picked it up, he liked it, and ran with it. Uh, and that's not necessarily the trajectory that most people follow. And what I always tell people is write, 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 never stop writing, but also be indefatigable in terms of your pursuit of getting it published. Uh, send it to as many um, publishing companies directly or agents. If you don't have an agent who is picking it up for whatever reason, then send it to a million others. You know, I got all those rejection letters that you mentioned. I remember uh, the the only kind of um, publishing tutorial that I ever read was an article about Vince Flynn that talked about how, you know, he had been writing on his own. I think he was an insurance salesman up in Minnesota and yeah. then wrote and he got all of the rejection letters. And what he did is he took all the rejection letters and put, put them up, plastered them, wallpapered one room where he wrote as kind of motivation for him. But he said to himself, no matter what, I'm going to get published. I'm going to continue to pursue it over and over again. So there's really no magic. It's really a, a matter of hard work, tenacity, diligence. Sometimes it's also luck. Like with me, I think it was fortunate that somebody picked it up right away. I hardly ever had to do any kind of, you know, shoe leather work. Um, yeah, I had a couple of rejections, but man, it happened very, very fast. But it's for me, I think what I tell people who ask me, what should I do if I want to get published? And I said, just Never take no for an answer, because if you've taken the time to write something, uh, it's probably going to be something that there's a market for, that somebody's going to want to read. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been inspired to write it. It's not as if you're just doodling for your own pleasure. There's and there's going to be a market for it. The question is, how big is the market? And does somebody is it someone able to discern the size of that market? So getting yourself the right uh, kind of, I, I guess, accomplice whether it be an agent or a publishing company to assist in doing this, someone I, I firmly believe, and I'm not being naive about this simply because I've had some easy, relatively easy success. I think that there's, if you've spent time on something, there's a market for it out there. And if you continue to pursue it, you'll get published. Okay. And I think that's something you should never be deterred or dissuaded from. No, I appreciate that. Um, I believe there's a market for it out there. I'll tell you offline what it is, because that's something I, I don't want to release in public yet. But it is, um, I think you can gather what my philosophy of life and, and politics is from our short discussion. And uh, I believe that people who share that philosophy would very much like what I have to say in this book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there are, you know, some of the best contacts are, you know, I do, um, I write, um, I contribute to other books, nonfiction books. Um, let me see. I've got a couple behind me, but um, there are I've written for Regnery in the past, or at least at least my chapters of a Regnery published books uh, have been published by Regnery. And yeah. um, I do think that those kind of publishers are a more receptive audience, but the big publishing houses, too. I mean, they're always looking for content. 
And frankly, I've seen a lot of things that get published that I scratch my head about, but you have to remember, it's a big country, it's a big world. We've got 350 million people here. There's yeah. going to be hundreds of thousands of people who are interested in basket weaving by tortoises. Okay, so there's, a, <laughs> there's going to be something there for you. And you just have to find the agent or the publishing company that recognizes the value of your contribution. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you know what? That's good advice. And uh, it's it's time for me to start looking down that road as well as the self-publishing road. So I'll do that. So, um, so Peter, um, how do people find out about your 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 writing work? How do they get a hold yeah. of uh, your books? And how well, the best they, way to find, find out about it is go to Amazon and order it. <laughs> okay, it's, yeah, it's easy 100%. to find. Uh, all the books are there: Target Omega, Second Strike, which is the sequel to Target Omega, and then uh, the W. B. Griffin one, Devil's Weapons, Devil's Assassins will be coming out uh, pretty soon, also. And as I said, Black Russian. At some point, we don't have a publishing date for Black Russian. But um, the you know you can go to Penguin Random House and yep. look there, and there's information there. But I'm you know look you, you just all I have to do is publish or uh, I'm sorry, uh, type my name into the web, and I'll pop up in a number of different contexts. Okay, I'll I'll be there as a civil rights commissioner, as an NLRB member, as just kind of a gadfly. I do the usual conservative talk show circuit and have been for quite some time. And, you know, I'm out there. I'm always speaking about some subject. I make enemies uh, because I am fairly, look, I'm a guy who come from, uh, I'm about the only male member of my family who didn't serve in the military, but I come from a very patriotic family. Uh, we've had people who served in the Marines and in the Army and the Special Forces. We had one Navy guy who's kind of like the black sheep of the family. Uh, <laughs> no no Air Force folks. Uh my, Funny story is my brother-in-law, who is one of the guys I go to to make sure that my writing sounds like something that, you know, a special ops guy would do. He has three grandkids who are Marines and he hates Marines for reasons that I'll tell you some other time. <laughs> it's, sure. it's actually hilarious. It's really funny. Um, but, you know, I mean, he doesn't hate, hate Marines because he's got three grandkids who are Marines. So I I want to, you know, I, I, I honor those folks. I want to make sure that we honor America. I think too many novelists out there tend to trash America. Yep. Um, it's not that I'm just always constantly singing Yankee Doodle Dandy or anything like that. But I do think it's the greatest country in the history of the world. I do think that the people who have served this country are some of the greatest, finest people I've ever met. I get I have a lot of letters from people that I've gotten to meet, thankfully, former Green Berets, SEALs, um, uh, you know, Marine Recon, all kinds of guys. And I don't think I've met one that I was not in awe of that when I grow up, I want to be just like that guy, you know? <laughs> so uh, those are the guys that I write for and I don't get it right, you know, cause I, I didn't serve. I, I may get the tone off just a little bit, but it's not for lack of effort. I really want to make sure I get it as close as I can to possible. And if it doesn't sound that way, then blame my brother-in-law and everybody else who's advising. Me. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm, um, I haven't ordered Second Strike yet. I'll put an order for that. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. And when the other books come out, I'm definitely going to buy them. I've become a fan. Thank you for the work that you do uh, as a novelist. Uh, you're providing uh, hours of entertainment and, and, and peace. I believe very strongly that reading fiction is good for the soul. Fiction ennobles the soul. When I read work such as yours, such as Tom Clancy's, that Provide a message of honor, provide a message of duty, of patriotism, of service above yourself. It causes me to want to strive to be that kind of man. And that The best fiction does that for everyone who reads it, and your fiction does that. So thank you for that, for me and for all the readers you do that for. We'll make sure that we uh, send people to Amazon to buy your books and all that other good stuff. But um, Peter, we like to end off the show by asking you as our guest expert, what are your top three expert action steps? These are your best pieces of advice for my listener to take on, to take their life, to take their business, to take their dreams to the next level. So what say you? Well, the first thing is work, 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 work. You know, um, I think too much attention is, is paid to genius and talent. Uh, there is a certain number of people who've got talent. You've got Michael Jordan's got talent. Jim Brown's got talent. You know, uh, Hank Aaron's got talent. Those are very few and far between, but we all have some form of talent. When you marry that with hard work, I think that's when you get a product that will sell. 
And I think you could be successful. I think the most successful people are not those who've got prodigious talent. They're the ones who have a prodigious work ethic. When you work at something, sometimes it fools people into thinking you're a genius. Hard work sometimes can look like genius. And then the, the, the third thing is, I think is, um, it's, it's almost kind of like Superman, you know, you know, truth and, and justice in the American way. Uh, I think that when you've got a, you try to conform your soul to something larger than yourself, it can impel you to do things that uh, go a little bit beyond what you're comfortable with doing and maybe you can achieve a few things. Again, for me, I don't necessarily have the greatest amount of talent, but I determined a long time ago that if I was going to set a goal, I was going to work at it indefatigably until I achieved it. And I may not be producing, you know, Hemingway or Dostoevsky, but I'm producing something that somebody enjoys and I enjoy writing. So it's a success. And I would just say hard work, hard work, hard work, and do not be deterred by the naysayers. Yeah, I think do not be deterred by the naysayers is important. Um, you know, back in the day, I got deterred by the naysayers uh, around my writing. And that is, <laughs> that's my biggest regret in life is that I let that happen. But the good news is that I got in touch with a whole bunch of great people, great writers uh, and great human beings who rekindled that dream for me. And I wrote the book and it's ready and I'm going to do something about it. And I'm grateful that I get to write books now. And, you know, I've got a book that's on the bestseller list right now. Pinch me. I'm dreaming. And <laughs> um, it's a book that not only is on the bestseller list, but honestly, I think it's a book that's going to help change America because we need to get more Americans to stop spending their money with the wokesters and to start spending their money with the patriotic companies. If we can, if we can divert 10% of the money spent with the woke consumer companies, which is about four and a half trillion dollars a year that's spent there, mm -hmm. 450 billion to 500, 500 billion goes to patriotic companies. If instead, of, if instead of spending money with Disney and Victoria's Secret uh, and companies like that, you spend money with In-N-Out Burger, with the UFC, you know, with Hobby Lobby, then you're going to help change America. And our objective is that this list of 123 is just an initial list. We want a thousand companies and then 10,000 companies on it. At some point, we're going to ask companies to reach out to us and say, why should we include you on the Patriot list? And let's get you on this Patriot list so that we can help change the country. Because one thing about bullies is they're scared. And when you fight back, they usually cower back. That's right. One swift punch and all of a sudden... It stops right there. But if you continue to concede, if you make concessions, they'll take more and more and more and more. And I got to tell you, I don't want to wax philosophical here, but this morning I was just thinking about, I don't know if you know who Victor Davis Hansen is, but of course he wrote, I do. yeah, great, Victor wrote something today that was really depressing. And the reason it was depressing is because I think he's completely right. Uh, the country's at a point now where, you know, I think a lot of people have thought about this. Uh, I'm, you know, I've been around for a while. I've never seen the country in this kind of shape. At in, in our leadership is so bereft of the values that made the country great, and we think that somehow we've been granted this country as if we don't have to continue to nurture it and make sure we protect it and all the the, the virtues of it, and it's just going to always con con, uh, exist this way. And uh, I'm afraid of where we're going right now. You should be. You should be. It's not a good time uh, right now to be um, living in America. I want to quote from our book, okay? Um, at the beginning of each section of our book, we have a quote from a great man or woman. And this is from Ronald Reagan. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Right. And that's where we're at right now. So um, Victor Davis Hanson is correct, but I want to say something uh, to you and to all uh, lovers of freedom. Um, there is a God and he is on the side of the angels and what he expects from us is to meet the tests and there are always going to be tests for us always 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 in the 40s the test was 
Nazism and fascism. The Cold War was godless communism. Unfortunately, we weren't smart about how we defeated godless communism. We defeated it abroad, but we forgot to defeat it at home. Right. And right now, we're in a cold civil war. And that's a fact. You know, and conservatives better wake up to this fact and they better start fighting. I mean, look, I come from Iran, okay? And where I come from, when your side loses an election, you better leave the country because they're going to come yeah. after you and try to kill you. For the first time in my lifetime, last week, that kind of thinking infected the body politic of the United States. Yeah. The leading candidate for president was arrested, was arrested and charged by the other side. If you're an American and you think this is okay, you really, really need to give your head a shake. There is nothing okay about this. But if you're a Republican right now and you're thinking, how do we fight back against these guys? I'm going to tell you something you may not like to hear, but there's people on their side who've actually committed crimes and there's American um, uh, states that are, you know, red states and there's counties that have red uh, district attorneys. Um, I'd love to see some of them go after some of the politicians on their side that we suspect of real malfeasance, not the fake stuff that they're trying to say Donald Trump did. How did Nancy Pelosi and her husband make $300 million while she worked in Congress? I got to tell you, that just strikes me as as, as odd. How did Nancy Biden. Waters become a multimillionaire when she has only served in Congress? You know, and he has an IQ of 12. Right, right. So these are the sorts of things that I think, unfortunately, you got to do. And am I saying this is a good thing? No, this is not a good thing. We wish we didn't have to do this. But if you don't do this, you're going in the battle unarmed. And they're coming after, uh, you know, our side. They're coming after the Patriots. If they can come after a former president of the United States, there's nobody they can't come after. Yeah, so you know that poster where Trump is sitting there and just kind of pointing like this. And he says, um, they're not after me. I'm just in the way. They're coming after you, I think is exactly right. And what, what's really depressing about what happened last week is, yeah, they went after a former president of the United States. But having done that, what I think a lot of people who are short-sighted, meaning basically on Alvin Bragg's side, is once you do something like that, there's almost no coming back from that. You know, really? we've gone down a path now that's a scary path. And you know this coming from Iran. Certain, when certain things happen, there's a domino effect and you can't unpack it. That's that's why we've had this, this um, kind of compact for the last 250 years where you don't do certain things. It's understood you can't do it because it infects the body politic in a way that's toxic. And yet Rag did it. There have been some other uh, examples of that in the past. But now, you know, I don't think this stops unless, as you say, the Republicans hit back and do the same thing. If and they're going to do anything. And that's the danger of having breached this norm, because now there's really no stopping it. And if Republicans don't do something, then then the Democrats are going to continue this over and over and over again. It is my belief that there are some Republicans right now that, as we speak, <laughs> are hard at work to go after certain folks that uh, are potentially guilty of criminal malfeasance on the Democratic side. I believe that's happening. I don't believe the... Uh, the side of the angels, the side of the patriots is going to sit there and take this lying down. So that's my belief. I could be wrong, but, you, you know, I don't think re the Republican Party and the people that uh, many of the people that have been elected right now are not the traditional kind of 1970s, 80s era Republicans go along to get along. These are fighters, you know, and I think they're going to fight, uh, Peter. And um, your country is at a crossroads, but. I bet you back in uh, 1861, when South Carolina fired on Fort Sumter, a lot of people were feeling that something similar was going on. And when 11 states decided to secede from the Union and a and a war and, and a war uh, broke out and 600,000 Americans were killed in that war, you know that was pretty rough stuff too. We're just going to have to wait and see how how all this pans out. But uh, what we got to keep our eye on is we can't allow. We cannot allow folks like this to be in charge because if there's another election cycle and folks like this are in charge, kiss America goodbye. Kiss America. I think we're at that point. That's what kind of what Victor Davis Hanson alludes to today. So, uh, and giving his historical perspective, it's it's really sobering. Yeah, he's a historian. He's he's quite brilliant. Anyways, 
Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you'll come back. Hope Absolutely. You'll... This has been great. Anytime. Just ask me. I'll be there. I appreciate it. And, uh, and that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution, to find out more about today's amazing guest, the one and only Peter Personnel. Go to the show notes at thethoughtleaderrevolution.com or wherever you happen to listen to this podcast and go to Amazon and buy his books. They're awesome. You're going to love it. And uh, you know what? When your next series comes out, Peter, I'm going to call you and uh, uh, order a bunch of books and maybe you can se send me some signed plates and we can stick them in the book and hand them to a bunch of my friends and family and clients. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Will do. All right, my friend. Take care. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.